Okay. Now I'm super tall, so give me one second. There we go. Hello, beautiful people. How are you this evening? Very, very good to see you. I would like to officially welcome you to the Charlotte Museum of History. Thank you so much for being here and being part of history. Give a round of applause for yourself. Yes, indeed. Yes, so each and every one of you have the best seat in the house and we wanna say thank you so much for being part of history, but also this 30 minute documentary screening that will not disappoint. It will not only honor the history where we come from, but also how can we take some of the elements and themes in this documentary and do better for the Charlotte we love and thrive in. Um, I am Ohavia Phillips, so very honored to be amongst each and every one of you today. Never take it for granted. On behalf of the city of Charlotte, we would like to officially welcome you to the premiere of this very important documentary. We'll be watching a 30 minute documentary uh, that's outlining and will lead up to a panel discussion. So please be sure to enjoy the documentary, but also the panel discussion will definitely highlight some themes and we would love to hear from you. So I would like to give a why, because once again, in order to know where you're going, you gotta know the backstory and the perspective. So in June of 2020, Mayor Vi Lyles called together 15 Charlotte historians, journalists, and public servants to form the Legacy Commission. The commission was tasked with compiling a list of street names, monuments, and other markers here in the city of Charlotte that honor Confederate soldiers, slave owners, segregationists, and make recommendations on which streets should be renamed. And the process for approving new commemorative monuments and street names begun. The commission presented a list of several streets in Charlotte named in honor of slavery, slave owners, Confederate veterans, supporters of white supremacy, or romanticized notions of the antebellum South. The commission recommended prioritizing the renaming of streets that honor Confederate leaders and officers and figures who actively fought against racism and fought for equality. Upon the commission's recommendation, city council authorized the city to move expeditiously to change the names of those streets. This documentary that you will see will outline that and we cannot wait for you to enjoy. At this time, I am very honored to bring up the woman who put together all of these phenomenal people and then they tagged other people and then we have this phenomenal documentary, our Charlotte Mayor, Vi Lyles. Thank you for that gracious introduction to this work that we're talking about and the results that we're going to see on this documentary. And I want to say thank you for all of you that are attending. This is a time in our history that makes a big difference. But first, before I go into some of the things that I want to talk about with you as a group, I want to first recognize a few people that really did make a difference. I want to thank them and I want to say without your participation, we would not be able to even be here this afternoon. So I want to start with Emily Kuntz, who is the staff person that put all of this together. Emily, where are you? I want to thank the team of Lloyd Visuals. You know, um, they have been phenomenal. I want you to know that these young people, because they are young, younger than me anyway, um, these young people have changed their lives during a pandemic and have been so successful. So I want you to recognize them and say thank you. Please stand up and be recognized. All of you guys in the back. The best thing about them is they're always kind to my face when they get to have to video me. So that's really important stuff. Um, the other thing that I want to recognize are the members of the commission that have been so much a big part of this. Now, I hope that everybody's up on the front row, um, but I want to recognize Fanny Flono, who we all know so well, a member of this organization, <laughs> and what she did. Beatrice, B, I'm sorry, Beatrice Thompson, who I've always called B. <laughs> Levester Flowers. I want to recognize the historian from our group. Um, I don't know whether I have to say Professor Karen Cox from UNC Charlotte. 
And then we had some other staff folks that really helped to make this possible. Tiffany Blackwell, where's Tiffany? And Lena James, who I guess worked all of her legal magic. Is Lena here tonight? There she is, right there. Now I want you to know that these kinds of efforts aren't just something that one person does. And so I want to recognize Larkin Eggleston, who told me that this is an important act to, action to take. Now you know when you've got lots of choices on what to do, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, don't bring me another idea. But he didn't, he persevered and he brought another idea. So Larkin, I want you to be a really strong advocate for this. You've done a great job and I really appreciate that you've always committed yourself to this effort. So please give Larkin a hand. And the other thing about this, when it talks about taking a village, we have many elected officials in this community who are very much committed to this purpose. So I want to recognize our city council members and county commissioners that are here today, tonight with us, because this makes a difference. So please stand and be recognized, all of you. So let me tell you a little bit about why this is important right now. I like to tell the story of my dad who was in the military and he was during the war and when he came back from the war he had one choice that was given to him by the federal government that he could get a job as a person working for the federal government which he then began to do but if he had been a white soldier returning he would have had an opportunity to buy a home with a VA loan. He would have had the opportunity to go to college because that was the kind of efforts and that was the difference. And one of the things that I like and love most about this community is the willingness to recognize these stories as truth. To know that that truth is real and to know that if we're gonna make a difference, we have to change it. So this is just one of our actions. Think about this. Um, the city council has approved an equity framework. The idea of how do we look at our past and begin to bring what we need to see as the future forward. So today, Mitch Landrieu, who is in the Biden White House, called me and he said, I can't even do his New Orleans speech, but it's like, <laughs> I say, uh, yes, Mayor, because I still call him Mayor because he was Mayor of New Orleans. And he said to me, we got you a million dollars. I said, thank you. Um, what do I, I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do with it. But then he told me, he said, this million dollars is devoted to the planning that I-77, when it cut through the Macquarie Heights neighborhood and took out those houses on the hill, we want you to take a look at how we can put that back together in a way that makes a difference. And I want you to know that these are the kinds of things that we want to do. And this example, with this documentary, with all of the work that was put into it, is going to be our introduction to many, many efforts that go forward to look at our past, acknowledge it, but to also change our future so that everyone has an opportunity to be successful in the city. Thank you for being here tonight. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and at this time, I would like to officially welcome you to the screening. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Commemoration is about the present. We choose to honor someone with putting up a statue or naming a street or a school because they embody some value that we honor, that we celebrate. And so many of the street names here don't reflect the values that we hold today. Stonewall and Barringer, Jefferson Davis and others these individuals promoted hatred and racism and discrimination. 
And so as I sit here as a council member looking at Charlotte and how progressive it should be, it makes me more determined to ensure that we as a community begin to honor those individuals that reflect our morals and our values as we move forward. Today is about unifying our city. We know that this represents positive change. We know that it represents the willingness to examine who we are and to move forward. We take a look at our community, what do we see? Black lives! Black lives! Black lives! Too many times, too many times, you turn on the news, black man killed by the police, black man can't even jog no more without being killed. You're in your house sleeping and they kill you. Say her name! 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 I was heartbroken uh, when I saw the, the tape of George Floyd's death. I was heartbroken when I saw <clears throat> the killing of the, the gentleman in Minnesota or the young man jogging and was run down and killed. What happened with George Floyd really sparked the interest of a nation where citizens protested and they came out and said, no more. It was just this frustration, like people in any position where they have the ability to make a change saying, we hear you, but then not taking any action. And we wanted to demonstrate that as a city, we were supportive of a lot of the things that were being voiced in the street. We all took a different look at who we are and what we believe here in the city of Charlotte. And certainly the names of Confederate streets and Confederate monuments made us take a second look at, wait a minute, we, we really need to make sure that the progressive city that we claim to be is reflected in, uh, in our values and, and who we honor. We didn't want to create something that people would be against. We wanted to create a momentum for. And in that respect, I was able to appoint the Legacy Commission. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. It's a rather long um, presentation. The commission of individuals who understood Charlotte's history, historians, residents, scholars, identifying streets that bear names that we might want to take a look at. And to provide us the details on why streets were named this way, why public spaces were named this way, and what needed to change as a result. Charlotte has touted itself as a New South City since the 19th century. But as we learned, Charlotte, despite that reputation, is very much tied to the Old South. So the key points of the presentation is really to help us better understand slavery's impact on the growth and economic development of the Charlotte region and really show Charlotte's role in supporting the lost cause and promoting white supremacy. This idea of white supremacy really began to emerge during the institution of slavery. In 1860, slaves composed of approximately 40% of the local population, making Mecklenburg County one of the highest in terms of numbers of bonds people in the North Carolina Piedmont. Slave labor was, was really crucial to the development of Charlotte during this time, and local laws were passed to closely control the behavior of Blacks. Enslaved people were not allowed in the streets after 9.30 without written permission. The enslaved could not hold worship services. There was a town guard, which were early forerunners of police, who roamed the streets from 9 p.m. until dawn. And these guards were most often held up in high esteem if they ever caught an enslaved African violating any of these laws. 
want to talk a little bit about the Confederate survivors and their lost cause. Coming to grips with the, the fact that they had been a part of a war that was a failure, it, it's easy to understand why they would have latched on to this idea of the lost cause and that Africans certainly did not deserve to vote or be placed on an equal playing field as they were. There were ways that white leaders and, and white people in power tried to like put people back in their place and say, well, yeah, we might have lost the Civil War and we might not have slavery anymore, but we're going to still honor that history and we're still going to treat those people like they were heroes. This is the first instance that you begin to see this idea of white supremacy appear in the pages of Charlotte Observer. By the turn of the 20th century, you see the disenfranchisement efforts to prevent African Americans from voting. And this was a political cartoon that portrayed African Americans coming to the ballot with weapons drawn, almost taking their rights to vote. So these kinds of popular images that are used in the media played a huge role in swaying public opinion and getting them on the right side of white supremacy. And then by 1900, you began to see the emergence of white supremacy clubs in Charlotte. They wanted to make sure that only whites had access to good jobs. And these jobs at the time were primarily those jobs in the cotton mills. And so this helps us understand how whites were given positions of influence and how they were able to build wealth so much faster than African-Americans. It's because jobs were kept away from African-Americans. And it was just imperative that they maintain their dominance at the ballot. The legacy of slavery and segregation impact us today in our residential patterns, in our schools, and generational wealth, and on and on and on. Before we can know who we are and where we're going, we must know from where we come. Right now what we're doing is we're changing out the street sign. Um, I've already inserted the sleeve in the ground, so I'm just basically just putting the sign together right now. This is a historic area, so, you know, a lot of changes need to be made throughout Charlotte, period. So I'm glad they're actually starting with the street name changes and stuff like that in these different areas. The streets that were recommended for change, Jefferson Davis Street, named for the President of the Confederate States of America from 1861 to 1865. Pfeiffer Avenue, one of the largest slave owners in the city, he hosted the last meeting of the Confederate cabinet. Cameron A. Morrison was a prominent leader of the Red Shirts that worked to suppress and terrorize black voters in North Carolina in the late 1890s. Acock Lane, he was a primary architect of the state's white supremacy movement. Stonewall Street and Jackson Avenue were named for Thomas Stonewall Jackson, the Confederate General. We want the citizens to be a part of the change. So there's a robust community engagement where we're going out to these various communities, asking them their preference in terms of street names. I am the quasi-president for the Druid Hills Neighborhood Association. So from Atondo all the way up to Woodward Avenue, we encompass the whole Druid Hills neighborhood. We're all about improving the community and making it a great place for people to live, work, and play. For so long, especially in Druid Hills, people have come into the neighborhood and said, oh, well, we know this is what you want, this is what we're gonna do for you. And the residents have been able to say, no, that's not what we want. So for me to get involved with this was uh, a great opportunity when I heard about it. I went and made my own little flyer and went door to door <laughs> on Jefferson Davis Street to say, hey, they're having a meeting about the change that's gonna happen to the city. We are here to share about the upcoming naming of Behringer Drive. We'll provide the historical context on Behringer Drive and why that street has been prioritized. And then we'll provide the implementation schedule for your information and for feedback. The recommendations that the Legacy Commission made were informed by the feedback we had received from almost 1,500 residents. A team of us canvassed door-to-door -to, -door to collect ballots, answer questions, or encourage voting. 
Basically, we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to vote. We're doing that through surveys today. Are you familiar with the possible renaming of Jackson Avenue? Yeah. We allowed everybody to submit three choices and rank their choices. We review the names, I submit them to the committees, and we approve based on what the neighborhood suggests. One or two streets at a time, engage the people who live on those streets, engage the businesses that are located on those streets to help them through that transition period of having your street name change and get a sense of what a new name that people can embrace and be proud of would be. Checklist here, not the street name checklist. It sounds like this process is continuing. So, and, and I have a property on um, Barringer, and my initial thought was there's a lot of work and I'm going to have to change a lot of papers. It was important when we approved this process that we made sure we were dedicating resources, both in terms of staff and dollars, to help folks who are gonna be impacted by these street name changes navigate that change. Do I understand there will be impacts? Absolutely. Can I quantify what those impacts are? No. Can I commit that we are continuing to look for ways to help with those impacts? We've asked people to share with us the cost. We've asked people to share with us where the pain points are, and we are actively continuing to work through this. At its most simple level, that involves making sure people get their mail and things like that. People who have return address stamps or letterhead or whatever that has their name and address on it, that will now need to be changed. It might be website updates for businesses. And something that's supposed to be positive, we don't want it to turn negative because it's a headache for folks to try to figure out all the different changes that they need to make. So it's not the city coming in and saying, well, here's your new name. It's the city coming in and saying, help us think through this and come up with something together. Legacy, it means preserving something that other people can find out about with pride. My community was Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan was the oldest hospital for people of color in North Carolina. We had black doctors, surgeons, urologists, pediatricians, and it was an important icon in the Charlotte community. The hospital was located on the corner of West Hill Street and Mint Street. Being a student at, at a Good Samaritan School of Nursing, you were just spotless from head to toe. The student nurses and the graduate nurses always wore this cape over their white uniforms, and we always kept them clean and starched and looking good. We were a certain way from head to toe, and it stayed that way for three years. Nothing was out of place. It was required that you pass your classes and that you obey the rules. Otherwise, you sent back home where you came from. <laughs> that was baccalaureate Sunday, and that's my class. That's the dormitory. You see the first, second, and third floor there. On Sundays, we went to church, and we would start across the street like that, and the cars would stop on each side of the street and let us cross the street. You would try that now. That was graduation night. There's so many emotions, I don't know where to start. But you just thought about, oh, I made it, I made it, I made it. That's what was constantly on my mind. I made it. We had an unequal society. Our schools were small. Our books and what equipment we had were cast off from the other school in the community. We moved here in 1955, I believe it was. They sold this property so that black people could move into the area. My parents owned a new home. They were working, I think, about four jobs between them. I attended West Charlotte High School. And then we had to walk because the school was segregated in. And it was different. When we were growing up, teenagers, we would say, 
why would they name this street Jefferson Davis in a black neighborhood? Druid Hills, initially when it was built, it was built for GIs that were coming home from the war. So it was a primarily white neighborhood. And then as time went on, it transitioned and it became a primarily African-American community. That was one of the only streets in Druid Hills where African-Americans originally couldn't live on that street. Some of the other streets had deeds that said only white people could live on the street. And imagine someone who was opposed to your free existence honored up there in the street. I would hope the Legacy Commission is providing the ability for our residents to memorize names of people that either suffered as a part of discrimination and racism or were celebrated because they did something about it. From 1942 to 1949, about 20,000 African Americans came through the gate of Mumford Point. Mumford Point is a jutty into the river system there right off of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. That's when we were doing segregated training. And so instead of going to Paris Island or San Diego, they went to this place called Mumford Point. They learned and they were as qualified as any other Marines and they proved themselves during the island hopping campaign in World War II. The, the legacy that they leave behind of perseverance, enduring sacrifice is very evident. And in our society, how we acknowledge those things, so we name streets after them, we name buildings after them, we name schools after them. This is a step in the right direction. Today we're gonna to be doing the uh, Marfa Point Street Name Marfa for the renaming. My name is Philip Mack. I'm with CDOT Operations. I've been for 20 years. Um, I'm one of three sign fabricators here. Each fabricator will probably do anywhere between 15 to 30 street name markers a week. This is our EFI multi-head printer. We're gonna load the image onto the machine and have it print on our street name marker material. Growing up in the South, you just kind of got used to maybe the Confederate legacy that surrounded a lot of streets and the history that came with it. And this is uh, actually the, the print head. You'll be able to see it going back and forth. So it, it feels good to see maybe some social justice being done and seeing people think more progressively. After the street name marker is through printing, we're gonna take that over to our next step, our laminator, and put a protective coating on it to protect it from um, UV, and any other harsh elements in the environment. So we're gonna trim away the excess material and these are gonna be separated into their two individual faces for each blade of metal. We pull away the backing to expose adhesive. The excess material is uh, trimmed off the edges, so we'll just be using this one to do in holes. And the fabrication process is complete. Charlotte is an old city. It's new to the people that are coming here and to the people downtown that are trying to build it up but it's not new to the people that live here. So a lot of the old infrastructure has been here since day one, you know? So now they realize, wait a minute, we got an influx of people and the city ain't built for that. So we're trying to, you know, do a rapid change. And then they realize that a lot of the street names or certain streets like, you know, this one, Jackson, it's not conducive to the image they're trying to present. So we're not trying to have that as we move forward. Cause come on now, we're in 2022, you know? That, that relic should have been gone a long time ago. So that's why we out here changing them. We're a large metropolitan area. 
We're the 15th largest city in the country. 121 citizens every day move to the city of Charlotte, all looking for affordable housing, all looking for economic opportunities with jobs, all trying to identify a quality education. As businesses come here and look to relocate, as young talent moves to the cities from all over the world, we don't want them to come here and see something that might lead them to believe we're not the city they hoped we were. Then I think people will notice it. I think it helps us for economic development. I think it helps us for business recruitment, that we're willing to be different, to accept change. That's what's important. And that's why I think it's really important for the city of Charlotte to acknowledge its past and try to provide corrective action as we move forward. It's grown a lot. A lot is a mild word. And it's just awesome and emotional to look at that sign and remember some of the things that Good Samaritans stood for and did for the community. I feel like it's, it's a, a different outlook, replacing the old history, the bad or whatever, and just kind of bringing like a new light to this area. Today's unveiling represents positive change and a step in the right direction. This is a reminder that we are dedicated to reimagining civic spaces and creating a new symbolic landscape that all Charlotte teens can be proud of. And that's why we will rename the street Druid Hills Way. Seeing that Jefferson Davis sign come down and a community of African Americans decide their own identity. It remarked uh, a day of going up pride and victory. Are there any neighborhood leaders here? Melissa, Melissa come on. When I first saw the sign, I was truly excited. And I'm going to brag on myself. I was the one who made that suggestion for the name. <laughs> For the residents who actually own on that street to select that name said, okay, it, it, it means something. Charlotte is honoring the inclusive vision of the city that everyone gets to have a voice, unlike 150 years ago when it was only a small segment of the community that made those kinds of decisions. As a historian, I look at some of the big mistakes we've made over time. The one that comes immediately to mind is demolition of the Brooklyn neighborhood in urban renewal. And that's one of the great tragedies of Charlotte is the flattening of that neighborhood without listening to the people involved. A lot of historians talk a lot about the place. Brooklyn was more than just a place. Brooklyn was a lifestyle. Brooklyn had a soul. Now that we're in our later years of life, we still call back on those experiences growing up in Brooklyn. The Colored Library, the Colored YMCA, the Colored YWCA, the Lincoln Theater, their memories. We appreciate all of the work that's gone into trying to keep those memories alive. One, two, three, Brooklyn Village. Let me begin by telling you that it's an honor to be here this morning to celebrate this historical occasion and pay tribute to the African-American heroes, the Martha Point Marines. We applaud the city of Charlotte with the purpose of honoring trailblazers who dare to want to be a Marine at a time when African-Americans were excluded from the Marine Corps. It is an acknowledgement that the nation, the state, the community is repaying and appreciating the sacrifice that these Marines did for the right to fight. It's valuable that our stories are told so that people can learn and understand our past and where we have come from. 
I think those are the kinds of names and the kinds of individuals we need to celebrate because they reflect the hard work that we need to do now to build a more inclusive city. Once this commission work is done, I hope generations to come will learn that the policymakers, the leaders of the community, weren't afraid to make changes. They not only were able to change street names, but they fought to change systems that impacted the livelihoods of African Americans throughout this community. And more importantly, that we work with citizens all over the city of Charlotte to ensure whether it's housing or education or health care, that they were part of the change that occurs, but not victims of it. I think it's important that this have not just been a performative exercise, for there to be action behind it, for us to make sure that people of color in our community have opportunity, feel welcome. It can't just be we changed your street name, now we're done, and, and it won't be. Many people will say, well, that's just the street name change. But what it represents is a willingness for this community to embrace change. We are a diverse city, and we want everyone to feel respected. The generations that follow us should look back and say, you did the right thing. You laid the foundation for the next step. Very powerful, the imagery, I'm tearing up a little bit. Very powerful, y'all give a round of applause for all involved that made this happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, impeccable work. Now at this time, I am very honored to present to you all our panelists for today. In the following order, I would like to call up Mr. Larkin Eggleston, former city council member for District 1 and helped initiate this work during his time on council and also led the development of the Safe Charlotte Initiative following the murder of George Floyd. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larkin Eggleston. Next up, we have Miss Fanny Flono, served on the Legacy Commission and who was an award-winning journalist and one of the leading historians on the black experience in Charlotte. She wrote, Thriving in the Shadows, the Black Experience in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Flono. Next, we have Ms. Brenda Campbell, who has been a leader in the West Charlotte community for more than 20 years, serving with the Clanton Park Community Association and the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition. She was instrumental in helping the city determine how to move forward with changing street names. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Campbell. And I'm gonna try and get through this introduction without crying. My best friend of 10 years, seeing him do the work and build with his family to do impeccable work here in the city. How you show up is so authentic, but particularly how you edify and amplify our rich history here in Charlotte. Ladies and gentlemen, Khalil Lloyd, the CEO and executive producer of Lloyd Visuals. Yes. And also at this time, I would like to thank the servicemen as well for being here. Thank you so much for being a part in all you do. I would be remiss. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, let's get to it because it was so rich and I was here crying. It's a lot. It was a lot. Okay, so um, you know what, Khalil? I think I want to start with you and then work our way down the panel. What did it mean for you to be involved with the Legacy Commission work and this uh, amazing work as well? Yeah, it was an honor and privilege. Um, and first, I'd like to just thank the city of Charlotte, Mayor Lyles, and everyone that was a part of the Legacy Commission. Uh, it really meant a lot for us 
to be a part of this film, to tell these stories. You know, we are digital storytellers at our heart, but we truly care about the Charlotte community. Um, I came here by way of Greensboro, North Carolina, and attended UNC Charlotte, um, and I knew it was something special about this city. And so I've been intentional about investing here in the city, uh, growing my business here, and uh, so far Charlotte has supported us, it has embraced us, and uh, this is just a personification of true collaboration. And so uh, it meant everything for us to be a part of this story, for us to be a part of documenting the history, but then also be a part of history as well. And um, I'm just really thankful for the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. And Ms. Brenda, I want to ask you the same thing. What did it mean to be involved with the Legacy Commission work? Well, as a community representative of Native Charlatan of Charlotte, North Carolina, it was everything to me to be part of this because as you talked about the history of it, right, and what it meant, and to make a difference in the community, it was everything. So I thank you, Mayor, and I thank you, Commission. Thank you. Amazing. And yes, Ms. Fanny, I wanna ask you the same thing. What did it feel? Well, um, as a journalist, of course, this was something that was very interesting to me to be a part of, uh, but as a person who's part of this community, I was very, uh, honored to be invited to be a part of this commission that looked at the legacy of segregation and enslavement in this community and how that manifested itself in our street signs and in our monuments and in some of our, even in some of our buildings. Uh, and so it, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a pleasure to be involved with all of the people who were on that commission uh, it was a very uh, diverse group of people, and we had diverse opinions. Um, and uh, but it was it was always it's always been uh, interesting to me to have people who come from different viewpoints, from different perspectives, from different backgrounds, who can come together and look at an issue and agree that something was wrong and that something needed to be righted, and to find a way to reach consensus on how. To to make to right those wrongs, so uh, it has been uh, uh, a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, thought-provoking process for me. Uh, so I was glad to be a part of it, and I thank you, Vi, for inviting me to be uh, on this commission. Absolutely, Larkin. I think that. There had been far too many times where we'd seen tragedy in our community and across the country and people just express their, their sorrow or their anger or their whatever, but it doesn't actually yield something uh, material, it doesn't yield change. And I think this was an opportunity for us. Um, there are plenty of people who seek elected office to be something, but there are others who who seek elected office to do something. And I think uh, Mayor Lyles and Councilmember Graham are two great examples I've had and been able to follow of people who run for office to do something. Uh, I wanted to be somebody who ran for office to do something. And this was an opportunity to take something awful uh, and turn it into some bit of positive change for our community. So something I was really proud to, to play a small role in and um, just incredible the way that you've captured that process and the, the motivation and the and the impact it has on the way that people feel who've long felt unseen to now, um, I think that was the most powerful moment to me was you have somebody who went to the Good Samaritan um, school to stand there and be so, um, so moved by that. I think that, that moment in that film made everything worthwhile. Yes, so. for sure. It did, I would absolutely agree, Larkin. And there was something said in the documentary that I loved, it's not just street names, it's systems. And I love that, and Larkin, I wanna start with you on this. How do symbols such as white supremacists, street names and monuments impact people and communities today? Well, I think if you are a black person who lives on Jefferson Davis Street, it makes you wonder what the leadership of your city, either now or in the past, thought about you being here. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to that, obviously, from a first-person perspective, but I can imagine that, um, that that would be horribly offensive and embarrassing, even, to tell people that you lived on Jefferson Davis Street and people would think, what kind of place do you live in right. that, would, that would name a street that? So I, to me, 
the idea that we were erasing history was, was silly. We weren't erasing history. You don't, no one learns their history from street, si right. street science, but they, in fact, I think we need to do a better job of teaching our history, but we need to be mindful of who we honor, and street signs and statues honor people. Um, every one of those people whose names we rightfully took off a street sign should have their name all through our history books, and yet oftentimes there's very incomplete telling of those stories and those people. Um, so we definitely don't want to forget them. We need to be constantly reminded of them, but we don't need to honor them. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Ms. Flodo. Symbols matter. I mean, that's just the, the beginning and the end of it. It's, uh, it's not that symbols only matter. Of course, you can't just remove a symbol and think that everything has changed. And there has to be other kinds of actions, as this film uh, rightly said. Uh, but it is a first step uh, to acknowledging uh, that uh, sometimes in our history, we, we've not acted in a good way. Mm -hmm. That we've done things that are, are just atrocious. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that we, that some of us, as this film rightly says, it's not everybody who decided on, on putting these names on, on these streets and these buildings, but some of us decided that we would honor people whose lives were not the best of us, they were the worst of us. And so, uh, and, and I think as Larkin says, I mean, you know, you, there's nothing to say that, that you should have a street named after you or a building named after you. That's, you have no right to that. Yeah. Uh, and so in removing these, these, these symbols um, that show us that, you know, people treated other people very, very badly um, and continue to try to, to keep people down and try to intimidate people with these signs. I mean, these signs were, uh, 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 a movement to intimidate black people into staying in a certain place and, and not being able to achieve uh, in the ways that other people were able to achieve. Uh, and so when we remove the, these symbols, uh, we, we start the process of, of examining, you know, how we've uh, not done well in so many, many ways and how we can move forward uh, together as a community to right those wrongs and to do better for everybody. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ms. Brenda. I'm just going to ditto everything that they said, right? But to understand that this history has to be told because it is our truth, right? We need to walk in this truth. We need to tell our children. We can't hide it any longer. So I thank the mayor for shining a light on this, right? because now is the time for us to tell the true story of the Beringers, right? Mr. Beringer was head of the supremacists, right? He was the main character of it all for the Jim Crow and making sure that it did not happen, right? So we have to tell this history to our children. Yes. That's who's missing it. Everybody in here is the choir. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave it right there. That's Amen. Yeah, give that a round of applause. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I truly believe that, you know, without history, there's no future. It's really important for us to understand um, where we come from, to understand where we need to go. And um, I think what's happening here in Charlotte uh, is, you know, it really gives us the opportunity to be on the right side of history. And so I just appreciate the leadership and the courage um, of the leadership for actually making a change. I think what's happening now is just really a microcosm of what's happening on the macro. There are many street names that should be trained across the nation and possibly across the world. And so I think we're a shining example of, you know, what change can really look like in real time. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, that we need to be able to find some type of truth and reconciliation, right? What was done in South Africa with Desmond Tutu and, and with Nelson Mandela, I think was a prime example of what uh, we can do here in Charlotte as well. Uh, but first, we need to establish those wrongdoings uh, and then make them right. And so I think this was a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Gems for each and every one of you. Ms. Flono, I'm going to start with you on this. When you hear the word equity, what would be your definition of equity? My definition of equity would be uh, to create a, a, a level playing field where everyone can achieve to the best of their ability. Uh, to, uh, and, and that may involve a lot of different 
things, uh, not just one one thing, not, obviously just not removing us, replacing a street sign, but um, but you know, for so many years, uh, the playing field for African Americans has not been level. Uh, we've, we've had to, you know, fight mightily for our place, uh, and we continue to have to struggle for that place. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, if you, if we can do the things that we need to do to create a level playing field and acknowledge the thing that we don't, we, we often don't want to do to acknowledge that the things that were done in the past continue to affect the present in terms of not uh, having a, uh, a way for people to uh, equally access um, uh, the prosperity in these communities. Absolutely incredible. Ms. Brenda? Hey now, <laughs> equity, let me bring it home to you. West Boulevard, East Boulevard, go over the railroad tracks. And I want you to see all the amenities that they have over there and cross back over the tracks and go to West Boulevard. Can we get a grocery store? Can we get a pharmacy? Can we get a health care facility? See, that's what we're talking about equity. We're talking about an equal playing field across the board, from zip code to zip code. It does not matter. That's what we're talking about equity is. Let's talk about don't want to go to the school system, because when we talk about that, we'll be here all day. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, to me, to me um, equity, simply put, is ownership. And I think back to, you know, examples like Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and the Black Wall Street, and what if, you know, um, we were able to reap the fruits of the labor and the hard work that uh, the Black Wall Street and the, and the residents um, were able to, to lay down, what would happen now in 2023? How much equity will we truly have? How much ownership will we have? Um, we could say the same thing about what happened, you know, early on in, in the inception of this country. If we, Wilmington. Wilmington, yes indeed, Wilmington and then Durham as well. Durham had um, a, a Wall Street as well. We had thriving communities all around the United States. And so um, for different reasons, those communities were tear apart, tore apart. And um, it's, it's really sad and unfortunate. But um, yeah, simply put, equity is ownership to me, and, and that's why I'm so passionate about um, owning a business here in the city and creating a system and creating a um, business that really just leads with love, right, as you say, and, and um, really just puts people over profit. And I think if we can change the business models that we uh, build up here in the city, then we're just doing our part to really change the narrative, to really change the structures in which, um, in ways that business is done. And so um, I hope that we can continue to lean into that word equity and it just not be a buzzword, D and I, right? That is actually something that we champion um, on the policy level um, and on the ground level as well. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Larkin? I can't do much to improve on those three um, ideas of equity. I, I think it's just creating a community where everyone's in control of their own opportunity to succeed um, and not hampered by things that are out of their control, the zip code they were born in, their race, their gender, their sexuality, whatever it is, um, but that everybody has the opportunity that the next person has to, to work hard, get ahead, and, and live a happy, successful life. Absolutely, absolutely. And speaking of happy, successful life, normally what comes up next in question is, well, what can we do, right? So aside from this phenomenal documentary, how are ways we can show up and pull up? And I think I want to start with you, Miss Brenda. So what would be some ways that we can measure goals around creating more equity and inclusion in ways that even our neighbors uh, can get involved and stay involved? Well, the first thing, we have this 2040 plan, correct? Get involved with it right let's talk about it let's get into the community let's be about it you got the place making coming in let's be about it let's be in the community let's engage one another right those are the things that we have to do as leaders in the community we have to bring the resources into the community and we have to talk about it and we have to be at the table because you know what they say if you ain't at the table you on the menu right so we no longer will be on the menu guys 
okay? We're going to be at the table, so it takes all of us. That's how we're going to make a difference. That's how we're going to be included. And we have to be transparent, city, okay? And transparency is the key. We can't hide it. And talking about business, yes, we have to get our businesses together. We have to get these merchant associations from zip code to zip code. That's how we're going to make a difference and make sure that everybody's included. And we have to keep the history at the forefront. We can't cover it up. That's your history. You need to know about it and tell your children and your grandchildren and the generations to come. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Ms. Flo, I want to ask you the same thing, right? What are some measurable goals, ways that our neighbors can get involved, stay involved? Well, I can't say any better than Ms. Brenda, as I've already said. But, you know, I, and I, I will echo that we all have to be engaged in the process. I mean, I, I think, you know, too many of us sit on the sidelines and kind of wait for somebody else to do it or wait for somebody else to lead it. Uh, you know, there are plenty of opportunities in your own communities to become a leader and to speak out and to show up, show up, show up at meetings, at, at, cou at council meetings, at school board meetings, uh, you know, and express your views about these things. Vote also. Mm. Yes. Keep, please, please vote. Uh, yes. Because if you don't vote, I mean, you really don't have a voice. Uh, and you can't complain uh, when things don't turn out your way. Uh, so I, you know, I think those are just some of the ways that you, know, you, you need to kind of get involved in the process. Yes, ma'am, thank you for your insight, Larkin. Vote was definitely gonna be one of mine because most people in this community don't. I imagine most people in this room do. Um, and as was said earlier, this room is kind of the choir, but I think we've got to do a more, make a more concerted effort um, to talk to people that we disagree with because we probably all agree on a lot of things. Um, but if we don't engage people in a genuine way to seek to learn and understand their viewpoint, even if we disagree with it, we're never going to change their hearts or their minds. I think, um, you know, the example that I gave where people initially, the knee-jerk reaction from some people in our community when we talked about changing street names was, you're trying to erase our history. If I'd have just said, I'm sorry, sir, you're an idiot, and walked away, that, that probably wouldn't have, have done anything to move the ball forward on this issue. Um, Instead, if you, if you say, well, is, is that how you learned about your history? Did you, did you walk around and look at street signs and then go to the encyclopedia? And No, that's not how we learn our history. But, so I don't mean to make a joke out of it, but I do think we've got to, to try to understand where people's fears are, be they rational or irrational. We've got to try to better understand folks who disagree with us. And I don't think we do much of that. I think oftentimes we drive the wedge further in and just say that person's wrong and I'm right. And even when you are right, sometimes you still need to listen to the person who's wrong. And um, we did a lot of that during this process. Yes, yes. And I saw, too, the way that it was documented, getting their perspectives on it, like for mail and things. So good. Paying attention to detail. Speaking of detail, Khalil, what do you think? What are some measurable goals, ways our neighbors can get involved? Yeah, I think simply put, you know, collaboration over competition. We have to collaborate. Uh, across lines of difference, across uh, political party, across uh, industries. And I think that's the only way that we're going to truly uh, form bridges. And uh, we don't necessarily have to agree with everyone, um, but we have to, in some ways, triangulate our viewpoint. And that's how we come up with the best solutions. And so collaboration, I think, is key in our community. We have really great examples of that. Um, in 2020, we had the Small Business Innovation Fund uh, that launched in uh, Honeywell put in $2 million and the city and other organizations, you know, match that fund. And we have other funds as well. Um, but, you know, we have plenty of examples of how collaboration has worked here in the city and, and elsewhere. And so I think we just have to continue to do that um, and not be afraid of opposing views. Absolutely. Not being afraid of opposing views. To wrap this up in the bow from the history that we've seen and the history each and every one of you are actively creating, what does legacy mean to you? Khalil, I'm going to start with you and work our way. What does legacy mean? Yeah, legacy to me means leaving something for my future kids um, to be really proud of. Um, you know, legacy to me is building a company and employing my brothers and employing people within my community and hopefully being a household name like a Colgate or a Lexus or anything else that we use, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, I hope that we're doing our, our part right now you know if everyone does a little nobody has to do a lot in the spirit of collaboration and so um, legacy is is looking at the 2040 plan 
is understanding what the city, uh, the makeup is gonna look like in the next 20, 30, 40 years, and being able to create ripples that then create waves of change um, for the next generation. Absolutely. Ms. Brenda? Ditto that, but with that being said, ownership, yes. right? Home ownership, what it used to be, right? Going back to the neighborhoods, buying grandma's house, making sure that grandma can stay in the house, okay? Making sure that we're building our communities up, not tearing them down, right? I wanna make sure that my next generation, because I have seven grandkids and five of them are boys that look like you. So I wanna make sure and very sure that I leave something behind for them, not just a home, but commercial property, businesses. And we wanna own this city of Charlotte, which we have created here. Right, so that's what I want to do is my legacy. You'll see it up in lights, thank you. Okay, listen, and we'll do a panel, how about that? And we'll do a panel, how about that? All right, <laughs> Ms. Flo, no, how about you? Uh, you know, I, well, ditto to, again to what all of you said. Um, my legacy, you know, when I think of legacy, I think of, uh, if I'm living in a community, I wanna be able to do everything that I can, that when I leave here, I think I've left the place in a better place than it was uh, before I was here. Um, that uh, that my living, you know, as they say in the old spirituals, mm -hmm. has not been in vain. That um, that you do all the things that you can do to improve the place that you you come to, to improve the people around you, uh, and to improve yourself along the way. Uh, I am I have been involved in um, looking at my family history for the last 20 years, doing some deep dives into the research and finding out about uh, my ancestors and looking at what they left for me as a building block for me to take up the mantle and go forward uh, has been just very heartening and encouraging. And I hope that I do the same for not only my family members, but for my community members, uh, for all of the people who I have come in contact with. So beautifully said, yes indeed. Luckin? I mean, a legacy from a personal perspective, I think, is you, you don't want to be the person 100 years later that people look back and say, oh my God, that person was a monster. <laughs> I mean, you want to be, there, there were people 100 years ago, many of whom used to have streets named after them in Charlotte, who at the time were considered leaders and heroes and you know the best of the best. And maybe they were only considered that by the people who looked like them, but they were certainly the people that were honored at that time. Um, and now in hindsight, we realize that they were not um, as wonderful as they were portrayed to be. I, I hope that for all of us in this room and in this city and in this country that 100 years from now, people will look at the work that we did in the early to mid 2000s and, and say they were doing the right thing. We probably didn't get it all right, but they were doing the right thing with the information they had. They did the best they could and they tried to make life better, not just for themselves and for their families, but for everybody around them. Um, and that that's something our great-grandchildren, instead of having to go around and change a bunch of things, can just look back and be proud of. Absolutely, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, this impactful panel, Larkin, Fanny Flono, Brenda, and Khalil Lloyd. Yes. Absolutely, thank you all so much. And as they're making their way to the room, please, we encourage questions. Wanted to leave a, a little bit of time, so if you have a question or would just like to talk to these phenomenal individuals, they will be here. Um, this documentary will be shown on the City of Charlotte's uh, Governor channel, um, so please be sure, the Government channel, so please be sure to follow the City's social media channels for more information about where you can watch. Um, also, the food we have has been catered by a local East Side vendor, Lati Dot. Can we get a round of applause for Lati Da? Yes. And three cookies on the side, um, again, from Albemarle Road, Central Avenue, Corridor of Opportunity. So please enjoy at your leisure. And to each and every one of you, thank you for being here. Again, being part of history. Your yes with this invitation is showing that you have a hand in it too. And from zip code to zip code, cul-de-sac to cul-de-sac, block to block, you are a part of that. I am Ohavia Phillips. Thank you so much for being a part. And enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you all so much.